Good morning. What a privilege and an honor we have to start our school week with worship. What an awesome privilege we have to start our school week with the Word of God. I have the privilege and the honor to introduce one of APU's own, um, our APU Chair of the Department of Theology and Professor in, in Church History, um, Dr. Jacqueline Winston will bring a powerful word this morning. She holds a, a PhD from uh, Claremont Graduate University, and she's also a scholar in the first five centuries of our Christian church. She's also an ordained pastor within the four square denomination. So as we prepare to rest in the presence of the Lord the rest of the week, can we please give a warm welcome for Dr. Jacqueline Winston. Good morning, everyone. When I came in this morning, um, I saw a very different atmosphere on the campus than maybe the first couple weeks of class. And what I noticed in particular was how many people had computers in front of them and they were in the libraries. And it occurred to me that this is an educational institution. Now, what I want to talk to you about today is hearing the voice of Jesus in a noisy world. And I want to kind of just start us off a little bit and I want to just do what, because in all of my classes this week, all of my students have to turn in a research paper proposal. Yeah, there's a few of you groaning, I know. And one of the things that's very different when you do a research paper that is different than, say, a mystery novel, I um, love British mystery novels, and one in particular, Midsummer Murders, is one of my favorites. And the reason I like it so much is there are, it's in, set in these idyllic towns, and there are always more people killed than actually live in the town, okay? So I always get a kick out of that. So, but when you do a mystery, when you read a mystery novel, you're not supposed to tell the end, okay? You, that's called a spoiler alert. There's this horrible commercial, I, it's a Mucinex commercial, where this, this, uh, this, shall we say, it's a piece of music, mucus. He's in the movie theater, and he stands there, and he gets kicked out, and he tells everybody the end, and everybody gets mad at him. That's a spoiler alert. But when you do a research paper, your thesis needs to be right up front. I'm going to tell you my thesis, but before I tell you my thesis up front, I need to just do a little bit of a disclaimer with regard to my method. Um, and the only way I can really properly describe this is to first make an apology to all of my colleagues in the English department and in the writing center because it's not possible to say this correctly unless you use the slang. My method today is I'm gonna get all up in your Kool-Aid, okay? Which means that, for those of you who don't know what that means, it means that I'm going to speak prophetically. No, I'm not going to tell you when Jesus is coming. I'm not getting ready to do end times. To speak prophetically is to speak the word of the Lord, not to predict the future, but to speak to the righteousness, holiness, and humility of the word of the Lord so that Christ can be revealed. Okay, that said, here comes my thesis. My thesis is you need to push through the rhetoric, your busyness, and the tendency to be discouraged by all of the mudslinging that's currently going on in the political environment, and you need to vote. Oh, no, she didn't say that. Oh, I've been had. I came here. I didn't want to hear about voting. Right, I understand. Now, as a backdrop, let me just tell you why I'm talking about this. When I uh, received an email uh, from Tim Pat about speaking um, at this time, I was where I've had the privilege of being for the last six summers, which is I'm working on a book and a project in England 
on um, Christianity during the fall of Rome. And I'm particularly looking at its connections to uh, Irish Christianity that will come after it. And because there's not very many sources written, everything is mostly archaeological that I'm doing my work on. So enough of that dull part. But when I flew to, I, I have this regular flight I have the privilege of taking, and by the way, I not only get to go to England most summers, but I go to Italy a bunch of summers, and by the way, as a plug, if you want to go with me to Italy this summer, I'm leading a study abroad this summer, so uh, please join in. So, this summer, I took my flight, my flight left on June the 23rd, and arrived on June the 24th. Now, most of you, that means nothing. But if you're British, it means everything. There was a referendum across the nation that was being voted on that all of the people were going to vote on, and it was called Brexit. And the decision was made whether or not Great Britain, that is England, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Ireland and Wales would leave the European Union. Okay. So I subscribe to the London Times, so I read it on a regular basis. And what happened was, I was reading it and not realizing that I was only getting one viewpoint of how Brexit and the impact of it was going to be on the country, on the country uh, because of the paper that I read. Uh, London Times tends to be written to ed educated people, a lot of intellectuals. It's kind of like BBC kind of thing, you know, only in print version. So I'm flying on a plane, my nonstop plane, going from LAX to London Heathrow, and I'm sitting next to a British national, and she's sharing what I thought everybody was saying and what was being said in the papers, was that Brexit would fail, that Instead, what was going to happen was it was going, Great Britain was going to stay in the European Union. Now, the question is, you're going, what does this have to do with us? Let me tell you what it has to do with you. When I got there, was, and I got off the plane, everybody learned that Brexit had passed and that Great Britain had decided to leave the European Union after being in it since the 70s. And what I discovered was is that there was a whole another set of language that was being communicated about why they should leave. And the major reasons that were being said why they should leave is because all of the foreigners were taking the jobs. And because if we kicked we broke this agreement, then it would make Great Britain great again. Now, they didn't use those exact words, but enough said. Um, and during the time I was there, I was in England and Ireland from June the 24th, and I went home at the end of July. And during that time, the pound fell first 11% and actually just this past Friday it just fell again. There was a 50% rise in hate crimes uh, and it was just a really just a really negative a bunch of really bad things happening that are still happening in Great Britain in parts of it. But the big issue and the reason I wanted to share what I'm going to share with you about why you should vote is because much of the scenario that was there is exactly what we are having here. A lot of the language and what they determined was although there was a record voting turnout for this referendum, Young people between the ages of 20 to 27 did not vote in droves. They're the ones who didn't vote. Now, where I'm based in York is a university town. And most of the university towns, big urban, uh, 
urban centers and whatnot, and young people were very, they're very international in nature, and they would have been against Brexit. But I kept talking to young person after young person and asking them if they would voted. And almost to a person, none of them had voted. And yet the outcome was not what was wanted. And there were a lot of marches and a lot of protests that kept on going, as well as you would see these, I mean, you would see on the media hate crimes being done. And so my point that I want to bring up to you is, you of all people, as people who say that you call upon the name of Lord Jesus Christ, are most equipped. Not because you're better, you're not. But because you may not, you may think your vote doesn't matter. And you may think it doesn't make any difference because Jesus is going to come back. But my reading of scripture tells me that Jesus said we're to occupy until he comes. And so there is something that you can do. Now, one other little aside. The week of voting was Glastonbury. Now, most of you probably don't know what Glastonbury is, but if you're my age, think Woodstock. And if maybe your age, I guess, Coachella Music Festival, I mean, it was, it's like the big deal. And in the night that all the wonderful young people should have been voting, Adele was getting it on, okay? That was what was going on. There was, Adele, Adele was out there and it was blowout and everybody was everywhere and it was great. My personal opinion is they should have found a way to have some voting booths out there at Glastonbury, but that's another thing. So the point is, is that while everybody is busy, you're busy getting ready for your papers, you are pushing hard and you've got midterms, you've got your first quizzes, you've got proposals, you've got a lot of things going on, and let's just face it, right now the tenor of the political environment makes you want to have to take a bath. We all agree, it's ugly. But the truth is, is if you and I, who believe that we have the spirit of the living God living within us, aren't willing to participate, who can of anyone hear God's voice and do what he would have us do? Now, to not vote, forgive me, all you who are my students, here it comes. You know I cannot talk very long without saying the word raggedy, okay? You need to not be raggedy, which I just found out. By the way, if you live long enough, you will become cool again, okay? And one of the things I've learned is that raggedy means ratchety. So, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry folks. So. Don't be ratchety. Don't be raggedy. You need to vote. Now, how do we hear the voice of Jesus in this noisy world? I want to use Joshua as an example. And the reason I'm using Joshua is because when Joshua was, was first made the commander of the armies of Israel, he was a youth. He was young. And the passage even refers to him as the lad, Na'ar. And I want to use him as an example because here's what's at the core that I think we need to understand. Uh, as many of you know, I'm a church historian. And one of the things that's fascinating is all of the major revivals that have happened have happened in the wake of times of deep crisis, national and international crisis, and all of the major revivals, especially going back to the 1600s, have happened 
at the initiation of young people, all of them. And that means that, yes, you need to vote, but you need to be praying. And we all need to be praying for a revival of the Spirit of God in our midst. So, Joshua, son of Nun, he's Moses' successor. He was only one of two people who had been, who had come out of Egypt and was allowed to enter the Promised Land. And the reason that he was allowed to enter the Promised Land was because he and Caleb did not doubt God at a time when it looked like they would, that Israel was going to meet and encounter an enemy who would totally defeat and destroy them. So, just to remind us a few things about Joshua. Joshua recognized that his call was to fight God's battles God's way, not his own. I want to just kind of highlight two that you know about, two places where they fight a battle. This is after Moses has already died, and he's now leading, along with Caleb, leading them into the Promised Land. The first place they're going to encounter is Jericho. Jericho is a major city. It has major, it had major importance, and it would kind of like say, be saying, we're getting ready to, the U.S. is going up against Russia. Okay, so whatever, forgive me for that illustration, but I'm just trying to give you an illustration you understand. It would have been a big deal. So what you would expect is you get all your generals together, you have this killer plan for how you're going to defeat the enemy. Well, unvariably, you know, it never, it never, it's always this way. We have our plans, and then God says, ha ha, guess what? We're going to do this quite differently than you think. Here's how we're going to win. Here's the smartest strategy you can imagine. Take and put away all your, all your military instruments, and instead, take out the guitar, take out the drums, take out, get all the good people who can sing, and I want you to walk around their walls a bunch of times, and then when I tell you to, you blow the shofar horn, and then the walls will come tumbling down. Now, in our mind, we go, are you kidding? That's supposed to be a winning strategy? Let's replace every single one of those generals because they do not know what they're thinking or they're talking about. But no, that's not what God said. God said, do it. And of course, they won. So, when you win the big one, then the next one comes along, which is AI, and you figure, oh, we won that one, piece of cake. No big deal. Hey, in fact, um, you know, UTN. Let's take just UTN because AI is nothing and we can just, we can chew you up really fast. But before they did that, God said, okay, I need you to be purified. I need you to recognize that the battle and the victory of the battle comes from the Lord, not from yourself or from your own strength. So they're supposed to give up all of these things, set aside all these unholy things, and give everything and consecrate it to the Lord. Except there's always one person that messes it up for everybody else, and one guy decides he's going to hide a bunch of stuff. And so when they go out to fight AI, they lose, and they get beat badly, and they can't figure out why they lost. And the reason they lost was because they failed to obey God, and they took that which belonged to God. Now, a couple of other things about Joshua. One verse that most of us know, Joshua 1.9, Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Another one that we all know, Joshua 24.15, Choose who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. These are, I've laid these out because these are patterns of the way Joshua 
from a young man understood how he lives his life, that he lives his life in the recognition that God is the end all to be all. He is it. And that it is not doing it in his own strength or in his own power, but it is doing it in God's divine power. The scripture I want to kind of highlight then is Joshua 5, 13 through 15. Now, in this passage, they've been beating their enemies and they've lost in Ai. And then they get to this one point, and Joshua has, some scholars will say it's a vision, whatever it is. But he meets this man who is identified as the angel of the Lord. It's a theophany. In other words, it is a revelation of God. And he encounters this angel of the Lord, and he says, and this angel was the commander of the army of the Lord of hosts. And he asked the angel, and he says, hey, angel, whose side are you on? Are you on Viola's side or are you on APU's side? Are you on Westmont's side? You know, in fact, I tease my students whenever they have a big game coming up, and we pray about it, and I say, okay, so whose side is God on? Okay. And the truth is, is that what the angel said is the answer. Neither. And then he tells Joshua to take off his shoes because he's on holy ground. With regard to this election, the question is not, is God a Republican? Is God a Democrat? Is God an independent? God's not any of those things. And God's not on any of those people's side because you, when you say that, you miss the important question. It is not important to find out whose side God is on. It's important to make sure we're on God's side. That's the answer. So, why should you vote? You need to vote because you have the spirit of the Lord dwelling within you. And if you humble yourself and pray and ask God to direct you, he will. Not because you absolutely have the right answer. Because I know it's easy to go, I can't tell, and it's a mess. How do I make this decision? But the answer is to not not make a decision. It's not to abdicate your responsibility and leave the decision making to others. It's not because you absolutely have the right answer but because you ask to hear God's voice. You ask him to be with you, around you, before you, beside you, like the angel of the Lord of hosts. I already mentioned to you that every other time that we've had a crisis, and there's been a crisis, that there's been a revival. And one of the things that you should be praying is not only, Lord, show me how, how, to, how to vote, show me what to vote for, let me be responsible, and not just automatically assume it doesn't matter if I vote, which is basically what happened to every single young person I talked to in Brexit, in, in, in the Great Britain when Brexit passed. They said they didn't think their vote mattered anyway. It does. And as I mentioned, the first great awakening that happened in the 17th century, it happened in Jonathan Edwards Church in Northampton, Massachusetts, among the youth of his church. The second great awakening in the 18th, late 18th and early 19th century happened, one of the loci of the second great awakening was what's now known as Yale University and was known then as Yale College among the, the people who were part of that college, led by Timothy Dwight, who was the grandson of Jonathan Edwards. I came to know the Lord during the Jesus Movement. And the Jesus Movement and the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s was started among the youth, among the hippie culture. We are really, really overdue. We're overdue for a revival. We are overdue for a move of the Spirit. 
But it won't happen if you and I, and the only thing we think about is got to get a job, got to get an education. Yes, get a job, get an education, but make a difference in your world. I want to read a scripture that was Jesus's, it's Luke 4, 18 and 19. And it was the inaugural scripture, it was the scripture that was the inauguration of Jesus's ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We're looking at crisis in our country and crisis around our world, but I'm not sure that that's the way God sees it. I think God sees it as the year of his favor. And we get to decide whether we will be a part of the bringing of the favor of God into our world. Uh, on the end of my trip, I'm gonna have them put up um, in a minute uh, a prayer. And it's the prayer of St. Patrick. Among the things I was doing when I was um, in Ireland, I had gone to a small town called Downpatrick. And Downpatrick is where, supposedly, both St. Patrick and St. Bridget, uh, and, and as well as a third important, the three most important saints of Ireland, are buried. And I had gotten a sinus infection, and I'd been really exhausted, and I wasn't sleeping, and I just really felt rotten. And I really, really didn't feel like going to Downpatrick, but I needed to do my research there, and I was exhausted. And when I got past the city center of Downpatrick, and I was going to go up to the area where supposedly St. Patrick is buried, I'm looking and there is this huge, steep hill that I have to go up. And I have asthma, and I couldn't breathe, and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, am I gonna make it up these stairs? And I just said, God, I need you to help me. I know this seems like a silly, small little prayer, but I just really need your help. And I was standing there and what they had done was up the hill, they had put these cement stairs. And all along every part of the stairs was this prayer that I'm about to read to you, and it's called St. Patrick's Breastplate. I bind to myself today the power of God to hold and lead, his eye to watch, his might to stay, his ear to hearken to my need, the wisdom of my God to teach, his hand to guide, his shield toward the word of God to give me speech, his heavenly host to be my guard. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort me and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in the hearts of all that love me. Christ in the mouth of friend and stranger. I bind myself to God's power to guide me, God's might to uphold me, God's wisdom to teach me, God's eye to watch over me, God's ear to hear me, God's way to lie before me, God's shield to shelter me, God's host to secure me against the snares of demons, against the seductions of vices, against the lust of nature, against everyone who meditates in injury to me, whether far or near, few or many. I bind to myself the name, the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one and the one in three, of whom all nature has creation, Eternal Father, Spirit, Word, praise to the Lord of my salvation. Salvation is of Christ the Lord. 
Amen. Thank you all.